Hi everyone, I'm Ian. I do developer relations and partnerships at Tools for Humanity, supporting the WorldCoin ecosystem. And I am here to tell you about global proof of personhood with World ID. So in this workshop, I'll go over what World ID is, how you integrate World ID, and what you can build with World ID. Just want some of the use cases that it's really well suited for. So, World ID, right? If you have World App on your phone, our mobile application, you might recognize this little passport, right? But what is World ID actually built for? World ID is built to answer this very big, very important question. How do you know who or what is a real and unique person, especially online, right? AI is getting better and better at well, pretty much everything. It's getting so good at solving CAPTCHAs that the CAPTCHAs are getting too hard for humans to solve. And when CAPTCHAs stop being an effective way to tell humans from bots online, a lot of websites are gonna start resorting to things like asking for a photo of your driver's license or your passport, which is bad for your privacy and also bad for accessibility. A lot of people don't have government IDs, right? We've built World ID to be private, inclusive, and robust, right? So in terms of privacy, we're not interested in who you are, just that you're a real human who's only signing up for World ID once. We want it to be inclusive. We want it to be as accessible as possible for people all around the world, right? As I mentioned, less than half of the global population has a digitally verifiable government ID, which can make it actually quite exclusionary if you stop using captures and instead need people to verify like a passport. And we also want World ID to be robust, right? We wanna make sure that when it's being used for civil resistance, that it is truly one person, one World ID, right? Other mechanisms that might have been used in the past for civil resistance, like, hey, one email, one account, didn't work super well. That's why I got a whole lot of Netflix two week free trials. So, with all of this, right, there's a lot of different ways that we can try to identify that this is a real person, right? Email or phone don't really work. It's super easy to get multiple emails, super easy to get multiple phone numbers, but they're at least accessible, right? We looked at doing KYC of official government IDs, but as I said, less than half of the global population has a digitally verifiable government ID, and that also causes some problems in terms of scalability. We looked at web of trust systems. Scalability is also an issue there, right? A web of trust can work really well for, you know, a community, right? A few thousand people. But most existing web of trust systems really cannot scale to all of humanity, right? They'll start with an initial trusted set somewhere in the hundreds or maybe, you know, single digit thousands of initial trusted users that define like the starting state of that web of trust. But to scale to you know billions of people, you're going to have to be a lot of hops away from that initial trusted set. And in a web of trust system, the more like trusted verifications that there are between you and that initial trusted set, it's inherently the less trusted you can be because there's more opportunities for fraudulent verification. So we settled on using biometrics as sort of the basis for World ID. And when it comes to biometrics, there are plenty of different biometric factors that you can use. We looked at fingerprints, face scans, palm scans, right? The things that people might already be more familiar with, but those actually don't scale super well to all of humanity, right? Touch ID or face ID on Apple devices can distinguish about one in 30 million people, which for unlocking my phone, I love those odds. Right? That six digit passcode, there is a one in a million chance that someone guesses that passcode right on the first try. Right? But with Face ID, that's one in 30 million. And it's also not something that they can change or try to brute force very easily. Right? I love the odds that in the US where I live, there are about 14 people in the country who could unlock my phone with their face if they stole it. And yeah, I feel really, really good about those odds. If you're one of those 14 and managed to steal my phone, you know what, good on you, you've earned it. 
So the full other end of the spectrum in terms of how unique some of these biometric factors are, we looked at DNA, but it's not nearly private enough, right? There's no way that we could do anything with DNA and say that we don't know who you are as a real human, right? So what we settled on is the iris. It has lots of entropy. It's extremely unique, right? Even like identical twins will have very different irises. And it's something that doesn't reveal very much at all about who you are, right? Especially if that image is like infrared instead of RGB, right? So you don't even see like the color of the iris. You might see, you know, if it's light or dark, but it really doesn't tell us anything about who you are, just is something that is very unique to each person, doesn't change very much over time, is like very difficult to change intentionally, and is not something that you can capture very passively, right? So in terms of how we get those iris biometric scans, we looked at sensors and cameras on phones already today. They don't have a high enough image quality to actually look at the pattern of your iris at a high enough level of detail to distinguish that you're unique at the scale of all of humanity. And there is some existing hardware for things like this. Again, in the US, I use Clear for getting through airport security, where rather than you know, checking my ID, they take an iris scan. Um, similarly, actually, the uh, Vision Pro from Apple with Optic ID fundamentally uses this exact same technology of looking at the pattern of your iris. But with the off-the-shelf hardware, it was clunky, it was really expensive, uh, oftentimes still wasn't uh, the level of detail that we wanted. Uh, so we settled on building custom hardware, right? And this is how we've started with, we wanna know who's a real human and who isn't and turn into a hardware company. And if you've ever like worked with hardware, you know it's a total pain, it's super expensive, it's very slow, but for this very big, very important problem, it's absolutely worth it. So this is the hardware we've built. This is the WorldCoin Orb. The Orb has been in development since early 2020 and gone through quite a few different revisions. Uh, but the Orb's job is to make sure you're actually a human there's over a dozen machine learning models running locally on the orb, checking that you're not a cat, not a dog, not a photo of a human, not a mannequin head, right? The orb takes a photo of each of your irises and on the device calculates the iris code, that digital representation of the pattern of your iris. And then that iris code is checked for uniqueness in an MPC system that stores uh, the iris codes of everyone who's ever verified at the orb but split into multiple secure shares. So there's no one entity that has your full iris code. After that iris code is verified to be unique, your world ID is now verified. And the public key of your world ID is added to a Merkle tree on Ethereum mainnet. So everything here is built to be privacy first, decentralized and open source, right? We never ask your name, your email, your address, your passport number, anything like that because we aren't interested in who you are, just that you're a real human. In terms of decentralization, right, when it comes to bringing World ID to other chains, right, you can permissionlessly bridge those routes from Ethereum mainnet to other blockchains. The WorldCoin Foundation is focusing on the decentralization of the protocol at an even lower level, right? Exploring having other companies build, manufacture, and operate orbs, or even design alternative orbs from the ground up. Um, and in terms of open source, every single smart contract that we deploy on chain as part of the protocol is open source and available on GitHub today. 95% of the orb hardware is open source, and the majority of the orb software is open source and we are gradually open sourcing more and more of that which isn't already open sourced. So World ID has a lot of different potential use cases, right? Knowing that your user isn't a bot, knowing that your user isn't Sybil attacking and has one account per real human can be useful in a ton of different scenarios, right? Voting is one that's always super obvious, right? You wanna know that each vote was cast by an actual person, but you want your vote to be anonymous. For social media, we've seen that paying $8 a month 
for a check mark doesn't really do anything to fight bots on uh, a very big social media platform that I won't call out by name, but you probably know who I'm talking about, right? In terms of airdrops, obviously you don't want airdrop farmers and civil attacks. Uh, and customer incentives are one that I specifically find quite interesting, right? I mentioned the Netflix free trial earlier. I always say like the, one of the killer use cases for World ID would be bringing back the Netflix free trial because the problem for Netflix was that people would just never actually pay for Netflix. They'd spin up a new email account, get another two week free trial, and then two weeks later do it all over again. With World ID, because you as one human have one World ID, if they gate that free trial behind World ID, they know, yes, this is a real person, like not a bot, they get this free trial, and then if you try to claim that free trial again with a new email, you still only have the one verified World ID you can use. So you're only going to be able to claim that free trial once, and if you want to finish up that season of that show that you were halfway through at the end of that two-week free trial, well, you probably got to pay for Netflix. We've also built World ID to be super easy to integrate. Right? You can use it across web, mobile, and on-chain applications. And there's two main ways to integrate World ID. Sign in with World ID, which is pretty similar to like signing with Google, signing with Facebook, signing with Apple, right? Using the same standard. And then incognito actions, which are a little bit more custom, a little bit more powerful. Uh, more directly interacting with the protocol, but uh, requires a little bit more manual configuration in the process. So to start, we'll talk through how you can use Sign In with World ID. But first, I'll show you what it actually looks like to use it, and I will sign in to our developer portal here. So developer.worldcoin.org is where you can find our developer portal. So I'll click log in up here. I'll choose to sign in with Worldcoin. And it'll show me this QR code. So from within World App, I'll actually scan this QR code. And then I'll verify with World ID to sign in to the developer portal here. And then it will redirect me. Great. So I'll actually walk you through like creating a new application real quick. So for my app name, let's just say ETH Global Singapore. Uh, I have to choose a staging or production app. So for a staging app, I won't use World App as a user. I'll use the simulator, and I'll walk through that a little bit more later. Uh, if you're using your app on chain, you will use a staging app for test nets and a production app for mainnet chains. And then you'll select cloud or on chain. So if you want to use sign in with World ID, you have to select cloud. Uh, for incognito actions, you'll select cloud or on-chain depending on where you're going to verify the zero-knowledge proofs. And again, I'll describe all of that in more depth later, um, but as part of like highlighting signing with World ID, I figure I'll walk you through a little bit of the developer portal. So I've made, let's make a staging cloud application here. And for incognito actions, I can create an action, but let's just look at sign in with World ID. Right? I'll have a client ID, I'll have a client secret here. I'll add in some redirect URIs, um, and the whatever like auth library you're using should explain a little bit more about that. Uh, so now that we know like where our client ID and client secret are and where to add the redirect URI, let's look at how we would actually integrate signing with World ID into our application. There's lots of different ways that you can integrate OIDC, Open ID Connect, right? That standard used by signing with Google, signing with Facebook, all of these other major like integrations for signing in. Auth0 is one way. NextAuth.js is a great library for this. That's what our template repository uses. Uh, you can use your own OIDC auth library with our OIDC well-known file for quickly uh, configuring everything. You can custom implement the OIDC flows, but what I recommend is sticking with NextAuth.js. It's generally the simplest, most configurable, easiest to get going with, and as I said, what we use with our template repository. So with NextAuth, the only configuration you need to add support for sign in with World ID is this code snippet here, right? This is the snippet for one single provider. And again, like you don't need to snap photos of this. This is in our template repository. 
Uh, I promise it's a lot easier to copy the code from GitHub than from the photo on your phone. Um, but I just want to talk through it here so you understand what's going on. Right? So you set an ID, the name of your like, sign-in provider here. I mentioned that well-known file, which just includes a lot of machine-readable configuration uh, for signing with WorldID as like, a sign-in provider that other apps can consume. So it tells it where to exchange an access token for, uh, or sorry, exchange an authorization code for an access token, right? All the like really meaningful little details that you don't want to have to worry about. So you just give it this link and it has the configuration now. Uh, we will have the client ID and client secret that we configured in the developer portal. And then we're mapping the information that we get back from sign in with World ID to a user profile. Right? So in OIDC terminology, this user sub is uh, like just the identifier of the user. Because in World ID we don't know a user's name, right? We'll just return that sub as the name of that user as well. Um, in this case, the sub is the nullifier hash, the unique identifier of the user in the context of that application and action. So what this means is that for me, when I use my world ID to sign in to two different websites, they get different identifiers for me. So even if they try to share their databases with each other and collude with each other, they can't tell that I control these two accounts on these two platforms unless I choose to provide other information to them as well, right? I could choose to set my display name on both websites to be Ian Dillick, right? I could use the same profile photo on both. But that's information that isn't provided by World ID. That's information I get to choose to provide. Similarly, I can choose to be fully anonymous on one platform and fully doxed on the other, right? But there's no way to de-anonymize that account because I was doxxed on some other account that used signing with World ID. Nobody, not even WorldCoin, can tell that those two accounts belong to the same person. And one other thing that we return in the profile here is this credential type or verification level. Right? We talked about the orb verification, right? Using this iris code to make sure that you're unique and have only signed up for World ID once. But we also have what we call the device verification level, where uh, just for installing World App on your phone, it will check to make sure it's running on a real phone, right? Not in a virtual machine, not in one of the like app cloner environments on Android, uh, and provide a better than average civil resistance mechanism, right? It's not really able to attest to humanness, right? But it is able to at least say like, well, this is a real mobile device. Right, so your cost of a Sybil attack, right, the cost for every extra device verified world ID you'd want to get would be the cost of another mobile device that supports world ID and supports world app. So that device verification level is good for accessibility, right? Users don't need to go visit an orb. They just need to download and install world app. But it's not as strong as the orb credential. So with this, depending on which verification level that user has, your application gets to know, is this someone who's orb verified or is this just someone who's device verified? And you might give some more privileges or a nice sign up bonus to someone who's orb verified that you wouldn't give to someone who's device verified. That's totally up to you. But that's everything that you really need to know about how to integrate signing with World ID. It's meant to be really, really simple, right? I was talking to someone earlier and they're like, Am I eligible for bounties if I just like integrate it, integrate signing with World ID? And I'm like, yes. It, like literally, the point is that it should be that easy, right? Bot resistance and civil resistance are useful for almost any application you can think of, and it shouldn't be like a complete pain to protect against civil attacks in your app. So now I'll talk a little bit about incognito actions. Hey, with incognito actions, you're learning that your user is a unique human doing an action only once or whatever number of times you want, right? That can be an infinite number of times. That can be three times. That can be 10 times. But most use cases will limit the user to doing something once, right? Like verifying a social media account. 
right? So in a voting use case, for example, that signal might be who you're placing a vote for in this election, right? Something where if that value is different at all between when you're generating the proof and when you're verifying the proof, the proof won't verify. And the sort of basic flow here is that uh, in your application, you'll integrate our widget and it'll show a QR code to the user. The user scans that QR code and that will uh, let WorldApp know what application and action it should generate this zero knowledge proof for. Then it will generate the zero knowledge proof when the user presses the button to generate that proof. And then that zero knowledge proof gets returned to your application and your application will verify that zero knowledge proof either with our smart contracts on, on chain or with our developer portal API off chain. Right, so let's see what this actually looks like as a user. So here, I'll use our simulator instead of world app, right? So for a staging action here, we've just got some action identifier that got made up here. I'll click continue with WorldCoin and this opens ID kit. So for a production app or if I want to run the simulator on my phone, which you can do as well, I would scan this QR code with my camera. But for a staging app to make it a little bit easier, you can actually just click on the QR code to copy all the information in there. On the simulator, click paste code and paste. Yes, I'll allow it to paste. And that functions the exact same as me scanning that QR code from my phone. So now I'll say verify with orb because I set this action to require the orb verification level. Uh, but for the simulator, right, you get to choose which verification level you want to use. In World App, it will just use the orb verification level if you verified at the orb or it will fall back to the device verification level. So I click verify with orb. The simulator generates the proof, sends it back to ID kit, our front end widget, and it has called our developer portal API to verify that proof. Quite simple. Right, so everything for your integration with uh, World ID starts with ID kit. ID Kit is typically used as a React widget. We have a vanilla JavaScript version uh, if you're interested in that. Um, we've also recently launched uh, Swift and Kotlin libraries. We have a Rust library that is occasionally used. Uh, so if you're not using uh, the React version or the vanilla JavaScript version, it might be good to come see me at the booth and we can talk a little bit more about details there of how to use those other uh, libraries we provide. But here, it's just a single React widget. We have our app ID from the developer portal. The action that, again, we configure in the developer portal. You can create multiple of those for an app ID or you can create just one. On success and handle verify are two callback functions that I'll talk a little bit more about in just a second and then we can set the minimum verification level that we want to require. Uh, so if you're using TypeScript, we have this verification level enum where you can just say verification level dot device or dot orb. Um, by default, it requires the orb verification level. Right? So the zero knowledge proof that you get from World App looks like this. You have the root of the Merkle tree against which you need to verify it. You have the nullifier hash, which is the unique identifier of the user in the context of your action. You have the actual zero knowledge proof itself, which is this really long hexadecimal string. And then which verification level that user created a proof with. And this proof response here is what's used as the input to the handle verify and on success callback functions. Right? So we receive this proof and we get it as the input to this callback, but we have to verify this proof, right? I cannot make it clear enough that we have to verify this proof. If you do not verify this zero knowledge proof, right? If you just console log it and go, great, we're moving on, you will not be eligible to receive our bounties, right? You have to verify that proof. So one way to verify that proof is with our uh, developer portal API. So you can take that proof and pass it back to uh, your application's backend. 
And I saw a few phones pop up. We again have a template repository for this. Like all of the code you see here is public on GitHub. So please, I don't want to have to deal with like trying to help people copy it off of images on their phones. Um, so you pass this proof object to your application's backend. We have this verify cloud proof helper function for calling our developer portal API, right? And you give it that proof, the app ID action and signal that you configured, right? Make sure that signal is the exact same as what the signal was in the ID kit. And then we'll get a response code of 200 if it verified successfully or 400 if it didn't for whatever reason. Uh, with those uh, callback functions, handle verify is great for the uh, developer portal API verifications because ID kit will call handle verify as soon as it receives that proof from world app. And if you throw an error in the handle verify callback function, that error will be displayed beautifully in world app or in ID kit, excuse me. So when you're in that situation where you can immediately take that proof, pass it to the API, get a response if it worked or not, and then display that to the user, it generally creates a better user experience. On success gets called when the ID kit widget is closed. So if you're doing this uh, dev portal API proof verification, on success might be where you choose to redirect the user to the next page now that they're verified, right? And one other note uh, that I will say is if you're having your user like verify their account once with World ID and then you're storing that their account is verified with World ID, you should be updating that user in your database in your backend, right? Don't like return that the proof verified successfully to your front end and then make another call to your back end from the front end to say that this user verified, right? Keep things within the secure context of your back end as much as possible. Now for on-chain verification, slightly more complex, not really all that difficult either. So in our constructor, we'll set uh, the world ID router contract address. Uh, which you can get from our documentation. Uh, I'm happy to help you find that for whatever chain you want to use if you just come over to our booth. You'll set the app ID and action ID from our developer portal just as before. And we're calculating the external nullifier, uh, which in the terms of semaphore, right, the protocol in which world ID is based, that is the scope of uniqueness for the thing you're performing. For us, it's just that we hash together the app ID and action ID a specific way. Overall, it's not super interesting. We have the code that does all this again, so you don't need to worry about it too much. And then we'll have this function that, for our example here, we'll call verify and execute, right? This is like within your smart contract. Uh, you'll take in the signal, root, nullifier, hash, and proof uh, that you get return from ID kit, right? For apps that are using on-chain verification, we see that handle verify callback function used a lot less, and we see a lot more of the on success callback function being used to just temporarily store that proof object returned from ID kit, and then using it as input to a smart contract call on-chain. So in this function, uh, we've got this mapping of nullifier hashes to booleans uh, that should have been defined in our constructor and wasn't, that's my bad. Uh, it's just saying if we've seen this nullifier hash before. And if we have, we want to revert because we only want to let users do this action one time. The key difference between on-chain and cloud proof verifications is that for cloud verifications, our dev portal will track how many times the users perform that action. You can set how many times you want to allow them to do it there. For on-chain proof verification, you have to do that in your smart contract yourself, right? And this is an example of doing it for only allowing the user to do it once. So once we've made sure they haven't already done this action, we call verify proof on the world ID router smart contract, right? We pass in the root, the group ID will always be one because we only support the orb verification level on chain. If you want to use the device verification level, you must verify the proofs with our developer portal API. 
So that group ID will always be one. Uh, we hash the signal in a specific way for this proof verification. We pass in that nullifier hash, that external nullifier that was defined in our constructor, and the proof itself. If something about the proof doesn't verify, that will revert. If the proof does verify, it will just continue. It doesn't return a value or anything like that. Uh, it will just <laughs> prevent further execution if something goes wrong. Otherwise, we'll just move on to marking that nullifier hash as true in this mapping so that we can prevent the person from doing that action again. And then after all that is where you should put in the functionality for your smart contract to do what you want after you know that your user's verified with world ID. That can be minting some tokens to them. That might be storing their wallet address in another mapping to know that that wallet address has been verified with world ID and check that for other actions and other functions in your smart contract. But well, your functionality should come after everything that I've described here. And again, we have a template repository for this. We have 20K in prizes. Pretty simple. Use World ID for things where bot resistance or civil resistance are useful. Be creative about it. Uh, and then we have two separate prizes for governance and public goods use cases. For the prize pool, again, you have to verify the proof. You have to integrate World ID correctly. You have to make a good faith effort to integrate World ID correctly, right? But if you just like slap ID kit in your package.json and then don't do anything with it anywhere, you're not getting the pool prize. Sorry, not sorry. So that's everything you need to know. You can go to worldcoin.org slash hacksg24 to see a Notion page with a lot of the info I went over here, including our template repositories. And if you have any other questions, please come find me at our booth and I will be more than happy to help you out.